नमस्कार आदाब सत्याकाल दोस्तों स्वागत है आपका एक बार फिर से हमारे YouTube चैनल ब्रास फ्यूजन पर जहां हम आपके लिए एक बार फिर से लेकर आए हैं एक नया लेसन few hours on it and i i still believe that i need more time to go through the literature covering alien enemy and we'll be spending some time today to understand the concept of alien enemy with three different cases uh just to give a brief background some of you might be thinking that why did i start the discussion with alien enemy there is a precise just give me one minute actually let me close all this international trade law thing yeah so what we have been doing in this in in our private international law lectures is that we have picked up different concepts right from the first lecture we saw how foreign element is an important criteria what is the definition of private international law similarly what are the justifications basis rational behind private international law we also got into this exercise uh, we also got into this exercise of say identifying proper names for this subject and saw that how private international law is a term which is often invoked in relation to this body of law and in addition to that um, and in addition to that we also have conflict of laws there are criticisms and acceptance in relation to both the names we also saw how unification efforts are made in relation to private international law rules we also saw the character of private international law in terms of how it tries to tamper with the idea of space and time subsequently we were trying to look at different stages of private international law dispute in so doing we started our discussion with international uh we started our discussion with international uh uh we sorry we started our discussion with jurisdiction i'm so sorry so i'm still stuck with international trade law class so whenever you come across this term international just just remind me that you know what i mean you are maybe you are getting too loose with your vocabulary <laughs> all right and it, when we were talking about when we were talking about the concept of jurisdiction we uh, we tried to reflect on the fundamental attributes of jurisdiction and we saw that how what are the what is jurisdiction what are the core concepts of jurisdiction and how the concept of jurisdiction differs in relation to purely local matters and a transnational matter we also saw how the us re statement of the conflict of laws tried to say that there must be some link in order for jurisdiction to be established and we were trying to reflect on all those aspects one by one which were listed as part of us re statement of law of the conflict of laws subsequently uh what we did uh, in the last lecture was to talk about this question that uh, can aliens sue and in that regard we refer to the laws in india and we saw that section 83 tries to answer this question can aliens sue and in terms of section 83 answering this question of can aliens sue what we also saw was that aliens are divided into multiple categories so aliens are first divided into alien enemies that's one second category which aliens are divided into are alien friends now alien enemies are further divided into two more categories one category is those alien enemies which are residing in india with the permission of the central government and those alien enemies which are residing in india without the permission of the central government now there's a third category of alien enemy as well that those alien enemies which are residing in a foreign country so maybe not residing in exactly in 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 the country uh, with which india india is having a war and then we also read the explanation to section 83 and the explanation to section 83 read as that every person now we need to make a distinction between the phrases which has which have phrases which have been used in section 83 that every person residing in a foreign country with which government india uh, government of india um, is is at war with and so going by the simple reading of the or uh, going by the simple reading of this text it is a disjunctive idea and carrying business in that country now the word which is used in the explanation when it says every person is not alien enemy unlike the main part of or of 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 
section 83. And when that person is carrying on business in the country without any license uh, from, 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 from the central government, then for the purposes of section 83, that person will also be considered as will also be considered as alien enemy. Now, the question which Manu asked, and, and was such a justified question, that what would happen, and, and a number of situations were posed, in fact, not just the specific situation which Manu identified, but a number of situations where, say, a person is a citizen of, say, Sri Lanka, but then goes on to live in Bangladesh. Or, for example, a person is a citizen of 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 say Pakistan and India is having a war with Pakistan and that person does business in five or six different countries or if a person is residing in two or three different countries then how would the determination of alien enemy really how would the determination of alien enemy really work this is the question which is troubling us for now now what I did was to find some literature on alien enemy. And let me tell you, at least when it comes to India, I could not find one complete text, or at least a partially comprehensive text, a text dealing with alien enemy. I looked at at least uh, one of the CPC books which I had access to, and there is not more than a paragraph on alien enemy. Similarly, I tried looking at some of the articles published in good journals, and... I could not find anything substantive on alien enemy and how to determine alien enemy. And it was at this point of time that I realized that uh, mm, okay, just give me one minute. Okay, sorry. So, but at this point of time that I realized that maybe we'll have to go to the specific cases, specific cases which has dealt with the idea of alien enemy. Now, when we, when I tried to get into specific cases and Jagminder pointed out Daimlia Company, of course, that's the case, but maybe there are other cases as well, which are far more, which are far more accurate in terms of dealing with law relating to alien enemy. What I will do in the discussion today is to is to highlight some of these some of these cases and the and the points mentioned in these cases so when i read at, so i tried to read at least three cases on the question of alien enemies and all these three cases list they list down various rules relating to the determination of alien enemy and how the business of alien enemy is to be identified and understood so we will try to understand the idea of alien enemy, at least in, in the first part of the lecture, with the help of these three cases. The first case is Firoza Begum and others versus Divan Dalat Rai Kapoor and others. Uh, before, I move, uh, before I move forward, let me tell you that all these cases are not decided by, uh, all, these case, all these cases are not, uh, are, are, are not private international or disputes as such. These are general cases as well, but where the concept of alien enemies um, have, been, have been talked about. Now let's talk about all these cases one by one. When we talk about Firoza Begum and others versus Diwan, Dalat, Rai Kapoor and others, uh, to put the facts very briefly, because the facts are not relevant for our discussion in terms of how private international law plays, this is a property dispute between two persons. There's a person in, in Darya Ganj, in one of these uh, of one of the Ariagan area in New Delhi, and he had some property going by the facts of the case. And in and in 1944, he leased this property to another person, um, and 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 it was initially leased for six months, and then it was subsequently extended. Um, uh, the period is 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 either is 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 not fixated there. Now, in 1947, the person who leased the property to, to, to the other person, he left for Pakistan when partition took place. And subsequently, the property was transferred in someone else's name by that person. And now, when these persons in whose name the property was transferred by the original owner, they came to take possession of the property. It was, it was told to them that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, 
the persons who are actually in, in, in possession of the property, they are the actual owners and the person who has moved to Pakistan in 1947, he is not the actual owner. Now, this is, this is how the facts are placed. Now, the matter was before the court, uh, the Delhi High Court. And one of the arguments which was which uh, one of the arguments which was met before the court was that these are alien enemies, um, especially because of the war in 1965. And since the matter was being uh, was was being heard during 1971-72 when India was having war with Pakistan, uh, these are alien enemies, and one should and and therefore the suit is not maintainable. It is in this regard that court made certain observations uh, with regard to alien enemies. So what I'm going to do to clarify the law relating to alien enemies is that is that I'm going to I'm going to highlight some of the some of the important points mentioned in this case. The first point which was made in this case with regard to alien enemies is that the expression that is the alien enemy is not defined in the court. And that is true. So that's why this fundamental confusion which we are having. So when we read the section um, the, in the other class, it was almost clear the section is broadly placed. It does not really define who an alien enemy is. How do we determine whether, whether a particular person can be considered as alien enemy or not? Now, the... The judgment of the Delhi High Court is it goes one step ahead and says that although the expression alien enemy is not defined in, in, in CPC, but the explanation to Section 83, something which we just read minutes back, uh, it suggests that the subject of a country which is at war with India would be an alien enemy within the meaning of Section 83. Now here there is a, there is a question. We are trying to find answer to this question as to who is an alien enemy. And going by this statement of, of Delhi High Court, at least for me, situation gets further complicated. Because in defining or at least in trying to exemplifying alien enemy, it refers to another concept and says that subject of a country which is at war with India would be an alien enemy. Now, who is a subject? Who is the subject of a country and if India is war, if India is at war with that country, then India would be considered as an. Uh, uh, then India India would consider that uh, that, uh, that uh, the subjects from that particular country as alien enemy. Now, quote further. So that's the first point which has been made. The second point which has been made uh, um, by the court was that Section 83 only bars the right to sue in an Indian court if the person concerned is a resident of a country which is at war with india now this is a very important aspect now look at look at look at all these points one by one the first point which court is making is that the term alien enemy is not defined in the cpc first the second point which the court is making is that if you read the 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 main provision and the explanation the main provision that is section 83 and the attached explanation, one can say that the subject of a country which is at war with India is an alien enemy. So the term which is used is subject. Now we need to understand who is a subject. The third point which court seems to be making is that, sec that section 83 bars the right to sue in an Indian court if the person concerned is a resident. So it appears as if court is Court is actually using these two terms, subject and resident, as synonymous terms. And we will get further clarification when we will move ahead. So, uh, to simplify what the court said in relation to the third point, that the person, if the person concerned is a resident of a country uh, which is at war with India, then that particular person can be considered as alien enemy. The expression citizenship, nationality, domicile has not been invoked as of now. This is something which you, which you, which you, which you must pay special attention on. Court pay, court use the term resident and not citizenship or nationality to determine or at least to exemplify who can be an alien enemy. Court stops here and then it goes on to make another point. And that would be the first. That would be the fourth point for for me in terms of how the how how court tried to deal with alien enemy. Court said that 
when sex, section 83 uses this expression called to sue in 80 in section 83 then this expression section uh, this expression in section 83 called to sue has not been used in broad sense what do we mean by this term that this expression has not been used in broad sense what we mean by this term is that to sue only means to institute or commence a proceeding now there's an implication for this there's a profound implication for this and the implication for this is or can be explained as just imagine that on 1st january 2020 i was not an alien enemy and i initiated a suit right but in september 2020 because i am a resident of a particular country my country is at war with with india and i am declared as an alien enemy that will not affect the suit which i have already instituted when i was not alien enemy this is the point which court seems to be implying this is the point which court seems to be making the court said that the point of time when the suit is instituted and not to any subsequent stage in the suit is relevant for section 83 the point which i just made maybe maybe to explain this point again as i said when the suit was being instituted whether you were an alien enemy or alien friend that would determine whether that suit should be allowed or not if when the suit was being instituted you were not an alien enemy then that suit is a valid suit and subsequently mere fact that you become alien enemy court has actually held in this case that that does that will that that will not bar the plaintiff from participating in the proceedings this is the point which court seems to be making and therefore court concludes that the if the suit has been validly instituted no subsequent event could affect the right of the plaintiff the person who has filed the suit so these are the five important points which emerges out of which emerges out of this case at least i hope we are moving in 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 right direction to understand how are we actually going to identify who an alien enemy could be any questions with regard to what court said i mean there could hardly be any, but any comments on it any comments on what court has actually said before we move on to say a second case where tr court has tried to reflect on this idea of alien enemy okay it's there in the chat box okay let me paste again you can't see the chats i just want to make sure can you see the chat i pasted it at 145 no oh, yes can you hear me Maybe yes, sir. Maybe in between. Yes, sir. I just changed my account. I joined it from the laptop, so maybe I could. That was not visible then. Oh, oh, that's perfectly fine. So, so generally, you lose the chats, right, when you leave. Yes. That's yes. Okay. 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 So this is this. So I hope these four or five points are clear, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Then we move on to the next case with regard to alien enemy and uh, these are not private international law dispute but these these matters or these cases are really helpful in understanding who can be alien enemy for the purposes of section 83 of cpc something which 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 we are trying to understand now the facts of this case is very interesting uh, the facts of this case are as follows uh, the second case the name of this case is prem pratap singh versus jagat pratap kumar now, this is the name of the case. This was decided by Allahabad High Court in 1943. Now, in this case, what happened was that uh, there was a German girl uh, who came to India. And when the German girl came to India, uh, she, was, uh, she was working in a hotel. And she was being paid somewhere around 1,000 rupees for her work in, in, in the hotel. Uh, now... Apparently, she met um, she met uh, an Indian boy, uh, and they fell in love with each other. They got married in Masuri, and they started living together. Of course, once they got married, but uh, subsequently, of course, uh, the the wife, this German girl, she got converted into 
a, 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 she got converted into Sikh religion, it seems. And, uh, and she also started saying that maybe, maybe she, she, she should go and meet her mother and father. Now, husband insisted that you can, you can bring your mother and father back to India. Now, she left India somewhere around in 1937. And uh, she, uh, I mean, she left India in 1937, went to Germany. I think she got her mother and father back to India. And when she, she came back to India, uh, and this is something which is listed in the case, she realized that her husband, her husband's attitude seems to have changed. Now, uh, the husband was not living with her and also he was not providing her maintenance cost. She was living in a separate residence. Um, uh, I mean, in Dehradun, it looks like. Uh, and this Jagat Pratap Kumar, uh, that's the name of the, of the women in, the, in, in this particular case law. Now, there were many arguments in this case. The most fundamental issue in this case was that uh, whether maintenance should be provided to the women and if at all maintenance should be provided to the women, what should be the amount of maintenance? But strangely, there was one argument which was made in this case in between. In very, in very brief, this argument was put forth by one of the lawyers. And this argument was that since Britain is at war with uh, Germany, uh, and we are talking about the Second World War, therefore this women should be considered as alien enemy. Of course, court rejected this argument, but in so doing, court also tried to explain what do we mean by alien enemy and how do we determine alien enemy. And we are just going to read that part of the judgment. Very briefly, court has touched on the alien enemy part of it. The first thing which court said is that we need to define who an alien enemy is. In order for this German women to be categorized or not categorized as alien alien enemy, we need to understand that what is an alien enemy or who is an alien enemy in the first place. Now, court referred to Halsbury, Halsbury laws of England to get or at least retrieve the definition of alien enemy. And in this regard, the court said that an alien enemy is one whose sovereign or state is at war with the sovereign of England or one who is voluntarily resident or who carries on business in an enemy's country, even though a natural-born British subject or a naturalized British subject. This is very, very important. I think this one simple sentence, which is directly borrowed from, which is directly borrowed from uh, Halsbury Laws of England and also uh, being part of the common law system is, 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 usually accepted in India, and at least as going by the court's judgment, it looks like that the position in India seems to be the same. What it actually tries to say is that alien enemies are those people or those persons whose, whose state is at war with, say, England, and in, in our case, that would be India. And since, since at that point of time, India was a, India was a British colony, and therefore the statement, therefore the statement, uh, uh, um, uh, held importance. But that is not all. It goes one step ahead and it says that anyone who voluntarily resides in the country which is at war with India or carries on business in enemy's country will also be alien enemy. Now this is something which you will find very very interesting. Just imagine that I am an Indian citizen and I decide to voluntarily shift to another country for business purposes. And I do business in, the, in, 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 in say, uh, XYZ country. And that XYZ country is at war with India. Although I'm an Indian citizen, but because I'm resident there or I'm doing business in that particular country, that would, that would make me an alien enemy. So this is the contribution of this particular case. Are you getting it? This is a very interesting point. At least I found this point to be very interesting. That even though, and, and therefore the last part of this sentence is very, very important. That even though a natural born British subject by every legal standard or naturalized British subject 
you might be a citizen of Britain, you might be born in Britain. Similarly, I might be a citizen of India. I might be born in India, but the moment I I voluntarily become resident or carry on business in an enemy's country, I can still be considered as an alien enemy. Court makes another very small point here. Court says that look at Section 83 of uh, Civil Procedure Code. Says so that Section 83 lays down that alien enemies which are residing in British India, as it used to be before 1947 without the permission of the governor general and in the present case in the present section it's central government or residing in a foreign country shall not sue in the courts of british india and therefore court said that it is a settled law that an alien enemy is entitled to defend if any proceedings are instituted against him so in the last case what we saw was that date of institution of proceeding is important it does not matter whether subsequently you turned out to be an alien enemy, whether on the date of the institution of proceeding you were an alien enemy or not is what is the crux of the matter. In this case, one of the contributions or, or one of the significant contributions which the court is making is that if a case has been filed against an alien enemy, that alien enemy is entitled to, to, to defend himself or herself in any proceedings which are, of course, instituted against against him. The other significant contribution this 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 case seems to be emphasizing on, or seems to be making, is that voluntary residence could be a criteria of deciding alien enemy. So look at the terms which we have now. We have subjects, we have residents, twice. Now we go to perhaps the most important case, the third one. The third case, which is Sita Lakshmi Achi and others versus VT Virappa Chetia. This is a case decided by Madras High Court in 1954. So, one, yeah. one is residence, the other is subjects. Subjects is not clear here. So, it means nationals, citizens, or domicile. Yeah, that is precisely what I said, Manu, that in the first case, when they are using the word subject, they are not defining what they really mean by subject. But if you remember, I mean, at least if others can remember, I said that they seem to be using these two terms, subject and 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 subject and resident, at least for the purposes of defining alien enemies. So the court in the first judgment seems to be implying that in order to decide whether a subject is an alien enemy or not, we need to look at the criteria of residence. Are you getting it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, is it clear now? All of you, any doubts? Yeah, I'm sorry, I've, I've not been able to ask any doubts, any questions. Any question, any doubt as of now? No, yes. There could be just two answers. Can you hear me in the first place? Let's go to much more fundamental question. All right. All right. Now, maybe this case, uh, thank you, Shubham. Now, maybe this case would clarify the situation in a much more better way. And that is the last case uh, which, I, uh, which I studied for the purposes of this class. And that is Sita Lakshmi Achi and others versus VT Virappa Chetiar. Again, uh, a case which, which needs to be located during colonial times. And more than colonial times, a case which needs to be located in relation to Second World War. So this case involves some kind of business transaction between a person who is based in Myanmar. And for a very brief period of time in 1941-42, Myanmar was occupied by Japan. Now the question was that can the person who is based in Myanmar be considered as alien enemy for the purposes of of, 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 of of the law. Now, we are going to talk about, now this case, entire case traces the history of alien enemy. Extensively quotes public international law scholars, uh, domestic law scholars, including your Oppenheim, Ulla Maki, all of them have been quoted in this particular case to understand what is the idea of alien enemy. Now, this case starts with a very general point. This case says 
that when it comes to alien enemies, there are two fundamental principles of English common law. Now, what are these two fundamental principles of English common law? The first principle of English common law when it comes to alien enemy is that enemy subject is denied access to English courts. That's the first part. So the moment you are an enemy subject, Manu, just, I mean, I, I hope you are able to recognize that the word which is being used here is enemy subject. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But we need to further develop on it how, what enemy subject would ultimately turn out to be alien enemy. So we need to have a more precise meaning of identifying who can be considered as, as alien enemies. I hope you are understanding that. They are using a broader category now and then we will subsequently move to a much more specific way of determining alien enemies. I hope it is clear to everyone. The second, the second fundamental principle of English common law which they are talking about is that, is, is that the British sub subjects are prohibited from trading with the enemy subject up till the, uh, up till the time uh, uh, wo war is happening between the two states. Now, these are the two fundamental principles of English common law. And these two fundamental principles, to a large extent, uh, and at least the first one, we are certain about the first one, that first one is codified under Section 83 of Code of, of, Code of Civil Procedure. With regard to, say, to the second one, of course, if you read the judgment, you'll find that quote, that there is a discussion whether we should have it or not have it, whether it should be allowed or not, in the sense that whether such a law is also allowed in India. And court says that to a large extent it is allowed in India because there is no other law which prohibits the application of this common law principle in India. So by justice and good conscience, this law should be applied in India. But at least with regard to the first principle, we are certain the first principle is embedded in, in, section, in section 83, that enemy subject is, is denied access to English courts. Now, the second part of this question could be, who is an enemy? So court asked this question again in this case that who is an enemy or alternatively this question can be put in a different form is that what determines the enemy character of a person? When can a person be considered as an alien enemy? Now court said that an alien subject is a person in a situation that if there is a war, a person is a, a, a person can be considered as an alien subject when he is in some way connected with the enemy territory or enemy occupied territory. Now, this is a very, very important point. It says that when in some way a person is connected with the enemy territory or enemy occupied territory. Again, it is a very vague way of identifying alien enemy, some way connected. What is this some way? How do we interpret this term some way connected to the enemy territory or enemy occupied territory? And therefore, court acknowledges this ambiguity. Court said that yes, it looks like that it is, it is difficult to conclusively argue that whether one instance amounts to some way of connection or not uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and or no connection. So the court says that if you look at the common law, the test of enemy character is not nationality. Here comes the most absolute statement from the court. We are looking at the third case now. And this is the most precise statement which any one of the courts have, have, have met till now. That when we are talking about, when we are talking about determination of enemy character, we are not talking about nationality. So it will not matter whether I am an Indian national or not. But what would matter is residence. Or even if I am living in enemy territory for whatever purpose it may be. So the criteria for deciding enemy alien cannot be nationality. This is what the court seems to be saying here. But it can be living in enemy territory for whatever purposes it may be. This is point number one. Please remember this point. Point number two, something which court identifies is that if a person, whether he's, he, whether a neutral or a British subject, so for example, consider India 
and I am an Indian citizen. Now, whether I am an whether I am an Indian a, a Indian subject by by nationality. Now, if I live in enemy territory, even for the purposes of business, I will be treated as an enemy subject. This is what this is what uh, this is what court seems to be. This is what court seems to be saying. So the connection which the which this this judgment has identified that there should be some connection with the enemy territory or enemy occupied territory. That connection does not imply connection a uh, connection of nationality, but connection based on residence. This is what court is saying. Therefore, what applies to enemy territory applies equally to enemy occupied territory. Fine, there is a country. Now. that country has been occupied by another country which is at war with india then this test which we have just developed resulting from this from this court's judgment would apply would apply would apply to that territory as well now moving on so that means it will apply to pakistan occupied kashmir also in the sense that in the sense that the person residing in pok Would be considered a alien enemy if India is in a state war with Pakistan. Yeah, only when there is a war. Yeah, so yeah, that caveat has to come that only when there is a state of war between India and Pakistan. And when we say state of war between the two countries, it has to be declared. Yeah, so that's true. Any territory which is an effective, which is under the effective control of the state with which one is having a war, it applies to the entire territory. Going by going by the principle which we just read. Is that fine? Yes, sir. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just if you can just say or put it in the chat box, it satisfies me. Otherwise, just like talking to a machine, and I generally get apprehensive if if you all are able to listen to me. Now, when considering questions, court goes goes one step ahead. That when considering questions arising with an alien enemy, it is not the nationality of the person. Court repeats that point again, but his place of business during war that is important that's the important point which the court is saying the test is not citizenship or nationality now to put it in the form of illustration say an englishman carrying on business in an enemy's country can be treated as alien enemy for the purposes of for the for the purposes of of this particular provision now uh court has specifically tried to answer what manu was describing in the in the last lecture uh, when he asked that question court said that the subject of a state at war with say england or in our case india but who is carrying on business uh, but who is carrying on business um, in a foreign neutral country is not treated as an alien enemy are you getting it so the subject of a state which is at war with say india but is carrying on business in say india or in a foreign neutral country if it's carrying on business in india that is with the permission of the central government or in a foreign neutral or in a foreign neutral country then he will not be treated as an alien enemy this is from the judgment of the court itself court goes one step ahead and court says that the validity of and court is court fundamentally also tries to reflect on the second principle which i identified at the beginning of lecture so i identified two principles one is the uh, one is that the status of alien enemy bars you from bars you from instituting a proceedings in the court and second is with regard to the validity of contracts and the court says that when it comes to validity of 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 contracts just like identifying alien enemy it will not depend on your nationality but your 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 residence or the place where you are actually doing business court summarizes this point multiple times with the help of multiple authorities that a man any person may have say business relations or business concerns in two countries but if he but he if he acts as a businessman of both he must be liable to be concerned uh, he must be liable to be to be considered as subject of both with regard to the transactions originating respectively in those two countries so just imagine that i am an indian citizen i am doing business in two other countries and i'm 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 traveling between both these two countries regularly 
Now, while India is not at war with the first country, India is at war with the second country. That also opens up the possibility of me being considered as an alien enemy. And that quote specifically mentioned that the point that he has no fixed house or no fixed counting house in the enemy's country will not be a decisive factor. Mere fact that he he resides there for the purposes of business or he does business in that particular uh, he does business in that particular country um, is 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 good enough ground to be is good enough ground for him to be considered as as. Uh, as a as alien enemy. Therefore, there there are two aspects of residing, and that two in in relation to the person, without reference to his commercial intercourse. So, even if I am not say engaged in a business, but live, residing in a particular country, and that two in the second with re, with regard to the place of business, which uh, many a times in in informal language is known as commercial domicile. But the court has tried to clarify it at many point of time that domicile does that the, the use of the term domicile here should not be confused with how we understand domicile in technical terms, something which we'll study in the next module. So to put to put it simply, residence seems to be the determining factor of how we identify enemy aliens. Court again tries to put it in simple words. Court says that just imagine that an and that, that an alien, that an alien enemy is one whose state is at war with, say, India, or one who is voluntarily residing or who carries on business in an enemy's territory, even though he is a natural born. Indian citizen or Indian national, or for example, he acquired Indian Indian nationality through some other some other uh, th some other mechanism provided in, in Indian citizenship. Now, the test which has been taken of enemy character in in common law is not nationality to emphasize that point again, but settled residence, or in case of traders, maybe what is termed in informal sense commercial domicile. Domicile in strictly. So please don't get confused when you study domicile subsequently. When they are saying commercial domicile, they are only trying to convey a sentiment. They are not using domicile in a purely technical sense here. That is desire to live in a particular place um, for an indefinite period of time. That is how very simply we define uh, domicile in a technical sense. They don't mean domicile in a technical sense when they say commercial domicile. The last point, and something which which is which is very important, court said that this criteria is an objective criteria, and it depends on the facts. Now, what is what do we mean by objective criteria depending on the fact? When we say objective criteria depending on the fact, it means that that it does not matter what prejudice that person might have or what passions that person might have. So that person might be very patriotic or his determination to free his country whenever he can. All these factors does not matter going by how common law is placed. What this law actually, what this law actually prescribes is that it is an objective test and this will depend on the facts of the case, whether the link between the country, between the person and the and 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 the country um, which is at war with India can be reasonably established, going by the descriptions which I have just given. I now the fundamental principle of common law under consideration, which we are talking about, is say the procedural incapacity of an alien enemy to sue. Now, Section eighty three is precisely about that aspect. That whether an alien can sue, and we are particularly worried about alien enemies. We don't have any doubt that alien friends can sue, but a whether alien enemies can sue or not. Now, how this law is placed? Now, Section 83 is broadly seen as a codification of common law when it comes to say procedural incapacity of an alien uh, of an of an alien enemy to sue. Now. Well, in fact, if you read the judgment closely, at, at least at one point of time, somewhere in somewhere at the bottom, the court has went to the extent of saying that this premise or the common law aspect which we are talking about have been adopted and applied in India even before CPC came into picture and the earlier code of 1882 came into picture. So this particular principle actually reached India through Britishers 
and it was being applied as a matter of judicial uh, judicial exercise but uh, subsequently codified in 1882 and then finally um, uh, the cpc in 1900 and 1908 that is how roughly the position with regard to alien enemies are placed uh, of course uh, if you read the general literature on it uh, what seems apparent is that this is immense doubt there is immense doubt about how to determine alien enemy and what are the laws governing alien enemy but with these three judgments i think we are fairly we are fairly better placed uh, we are fairly better placed to to say understand the basic rules with regard to alien enemies their identification and in what ways we can conceptualize the business relation business relationship involving alien enemy and in what situations the suits which are filed by alien alien enemies can be can be it can be can be barred or cannot be barred in accordance with section 80c so these are four or five elements which we have tried to cover with with the help of with the help of of these these case laws now uh i hope it is it is relatively better uh with this maybe i will quickly try to cover some of the aspects which which i intend to cover today one is that when foreign state may sue and something which i have already talked about that foreign state may sue in any competent court but the only criteria or the provision is that and the proviso of section 84 is that the object of the suit mm, should be to enforce a private right vested in say head of the state or any other officer in his public capacity who is most present in it so that's a very very simple way of 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 putting it as to when can when can an when can a foreign state may 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 sue in any court of competent jurisdiction in india now this brings me to another element and since i'm just trying to cover some of these aspects which which i think must be covered as uh, as part of the as part of our discussion on jurisdiction is is with now the third aspect which i would like to cover as part of cpc is that suit against foreign rulers ambassadors and invoices whether such suits are allowed in india now section 86 deals with this specific aspect some of you who have studied public international law would realize that there is something called privileges and immunities and there are specific laws in india as well called diplomatic relations act 1972 similarly we have something called united nation privileges and immunity act of of 1947 so all these law all that both these acts also try to reflect on the question of suit against foreign rulers ambassadors and invoices cpc puts it very in a very plain way it says that no foreign no foreign state can be sued in any court competent to try a matter unless and until you take permission or consent of the central government and that to certified in writing by the secretary of that or, or by the secretary to that government that yes the foreign state may be sued the only exception to this rule seems to be that that a person may file a suit as a tenant of immovable property so without any consent from the central government as has been as has been mentioned in the, in 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 clause in clause 1 of uh, section 86 uh and when i say that as a tenant of the immovable property it seems very obvious that that immovable property should be held by or that property should belong to the foreign state only in such a situation can a person file a suit in that situation no consent from the central government is required now if you look at uh, section 86 sub clause 2 it identifies that uh, that when central government prescribes uh, or when central government gives consent uh, to file a suit against against uh, against a foreign state it has to take into account certain considerations so it has to take into account the consideration that um, that that 
the foreign state has instituted a suit in the court against the person desiring to sue it. Similarly, the foreign state itself or another trades within the local limits of the jurisdiction of the court. And similarly, if it relates to possession of immovable property, then it has to satisfy that the property is situated within the local limits, uh, local limits, uh, uh, within the local limits of the court. And similarly, it has also to prescribe that that. The immunity which has been provided under Section 86 sub clause 1 has been waived in relation to that particular foreign state. Now, if at all there is a judgment, uh, if at all there is a judgment against the property of any foreign state, then that judgment, then then that judgment cannot be executed. The decree cannot be executed without the permission or without the consent of the central government. That's another qualifier which is there as part of Section 86 sub clause three. All these provisions are based on principle of reciprocity. When I say principle of reciprocity, what I mean is that a very similar provision would also be present in the domestic laws of another country. So, mere, so, so this, this, this mutual, this, this mutual, I would say, arrangement to make sure that suit against foreign rulers, some foreign rulers or a state as such or ambassadors or envoys are not filed or filed only in a particular way is 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 something which is a which is a product of consensus among states what i just identified that generally as a matter of policy there seems to be a prohibition that a suit against foreign state cannot be filed and the other attributes of of this procedural aspect that if at all it is to be filed a permission has to be taken while giving permission certain considerations are to be taken into account all these provisions equally apply to head of the state say whoever is head of xyz state or any ambassador of a foreign state any high commissioner of a commonwealth country and similarly any member or staff of a foreign state or for example staff of the ambassador or envoy in a foreign state so this applies to all these categories of people something which we have already studied as part of public international law that what kind of people are eligible to enjoy immunities and privileges so it is ex so that extends to that extends to all these people similarly these these categories of people which I just identified, that is the head of the state or ruler of a foreign country, uh, although that term is not often used now, the term ru uh, 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 ruler is not often invoked. Now, what is said is head of the state, ambassador, high commissioner of commonwealth countries or the member of the staff of, say, ambassador, envoy or, or, high, co or high commissioner, they cannot be they cannot be arrested under uh, they cannot be uh, uh, they cannot be arrested under this particular um, uh, uh, under this particular code so that is how roughly it is it is it is placed now unless of course for example the privileges and immunities are specifically revoked by because by the state who is sending the ambassador in such such a situation opens up the possibility but that 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 is governed by broadly uh, United Nations uh, Im Privileges and Immunities Act 1947 and Diplomatic Relations Vienna Convention Act. Uh, and what are the privileges and immunities which are extended to 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 such to such staff? I think that should be it for today. It's already 2:30. So let me let me briefly revise what I what I did today. My fundamental my my fundamental uh, intention today was to go through was to go through the issues relating to alien enemies and the major reason for doing it was that there was a specific question and therefore it was needed that we clarify the attributes relating to alien enemy one of the common attributes which seems to be emerging from the case laws which we cover today is that identification of alien enemy is not done in accordance with nationality it is done in accordance with residence similarly whether that person whether that suit should be allowed is valid or not as per section 83 has to, to be determined by the fact that whether on the date of filing the suit the person was an alien enemy or not if the person was not an alien enemy on the date of filing the suit then that then then that suit would continue because section 83 does not as per in the in in, in the words of the code does not use a broad sense of 
of this phrase to suit. It merely means when it says to suit, it, say, it, it means that to institute the suits in a particular in a, in a, in a particular court. It further says that the moment a suit has been instituted, it would continue irrespective of the changing character of the individual. This seems to this seems to be emerging out of the judgment which we have studied, which of course section 83 does not directly talk about. Also, the aspect that if a suit has been filed against alien enemy, then there's no prohibition against that alien enemy to come and defend himself or herself. That seems to be the general idea. Subsequently, we saw that what are that what are the general prohibitions with regard to suits against foreign state, head of the state, ambassadors, uh, um, 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 ambassadors, envoys, or for example, uh, high commissioners. So these were some of the aspects which we which which we covered today. That central government has to give a specific permission, and if central government fails to give, uh, and if and if central government is considering uh, is considering that a consent has to be given, it needs to take into account certain considerations which are listed in section 86 sub clause two. That should be it for today. Now let me move to my other class. If there are any questions, you can put it here. You can drop me an email. You can you can put it on you can put it on the class Google Classroom. We will take all these questions one by one. And let me and let me tell you, we were able to have such a thorough discussion on alien enemy because there was a question in the first place. And I must thank you all who were interested in this discussion. That 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 often we don't extend our discussion about alien enemies beyond section 83. But the kind of discussion which happened it really uh, prompted me to go through these case laws and understand how the laws are placed in fact i have a in fact i have a suggestion if you are if, one, if some of you are really interested in doing any research and you are looking for a topic of course there could be many topics but um, into i briefly had a look on this subject called alien enemies and and in relation to in relation to indian jurisprudence on this subject uh, there is very few literature. In fact, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm consciously, I'm consciously restraining myself from making that statement that there is no literature, though there's no comprehensive literature on the subject. So if you are, if you're trying to put something together in short, in, in a very, in a very brief manner, this could be a good area of, 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 of research. Maybe not a big article, but a very small one, mostly for your self-understanding दोस्तों ब्रास फ्यूजन आशा करता है कि आपको हमारा लेसन पसंद आया होगा कमेंट बॉक्स में अपना फीडबैक देना ना भूलें थैंक्स फॉर वाचिंग